welcome to everyone who's joining us. Our speaker uh, is sitting in Jerusalem, where he makes his home. Uh, Gunter and I are sitting in Bloomington, and many of you are in countries uh, all around the world, so it's wonderful to have you with us today. We're meeting at a time when uh, a very, very difficult war is going on, as we're all aware. And when I flipped on the news earlier today, uh, the number of people who have left Ukraine already amounts to about a million and a half with more to come. Just a few minutes ago, prior to our session today, we were chatting with Sergio della Pergola about his own history. He begins life in Italy in the city of Trieste during the war years. And as an infant, really, with his family, uh, they too uh, were faced with staying in or getting out. Fortunately, in their case, uh, they were able to get to Switzerland. So he knows firsthand what it is, in fact, to flee one's native country and begin all over again. In his case, he did begin all over again. He's lived in Italy, uh, sorry, in Israel since 1966, um, a longtime faculty member of the Hebrew University. Um, without question, the foremost uh, demographer of world Jewry today. Whenever I have questions about the numbers of Jews, where they're living, how they identify, I get in touch with Sergio. Uh, and he's always helpful. Uh, in addition to his specialization in those areas, though, like many of us, he's now been devoting serious time uh, to looking hard at today's anti-Semitism. Um, it's uh, an energetic uh, force in today's society, unfortunately, has already caused considerable harm and poses the threat of more to come. So whatever we can do to understand it and find ways to restrain it, the better. And in that respect, as Gunther said, there are many debates today about how one defines anti-Semitism, who has the right to, anti to identify that, uh, what it is, et cetera. And our lecturer today is going to deal with those very questions. Following his presentation, of course, as is our custom, we will have discussion, and he's more than happy and willing to engage your questions and engage in serious discussion and debate about anything he may say. Sergio, it's my pleasure now to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Alvin, and thank you, Gunther. It's, uh, I may say, my first time at Indiana. I've been uh, in the States many times and I've uh, lectured at many schools, but not this one. So it's a, a honor for me to be here. And uh, in fact, uh, unavoidably, I also must share your thoughts about the, the tragic moment the world is living with uh, these uh, scenes of uh, violence and aggression and so many people are uh, fleeing toward uh, safety, uh, hoping they, they, they can save their families. And uh, of course it brings back uh, not, not really um, souvenirs and remembrance because uh, I was born uh, during a much more tragic moment in history because I, I cannot really remember directly, but the fact is that physically I was there in that situation. And, uh, and so my empathy is uh, complete to those who suffer in this moment. Um, uh, my um, interest in, uh, in anti-Semitism has been, of course, uh, sort of endemic uh, all of my life, listening to, uh, to the tales of my parents uh, and also intellectually. Academically, I'm a demographer. And uh, so my, my specialty is to work with quantitative research methods. I I'm not a historian. Uh, I uh, deal with uh, facts and data and questionnaires and surveys. And in recent years, I, I have, have had an opportunity to be more actively uh, involved in the study of anti-Semitism, uh, especially uh, in Europe. 
um, and in fact, my presentation um, uh, today, tonight in Jerusalem, uh, is about Europe. Uh, note that everything I will present is about Europe. However, I also uh, believe there are certain broader lessons to be drawn that I will be glad to discuss after my, uh, my presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, the um, title says how best to define anti-Semitism, a structural approach. Uh, you, you will see uh, later that I, I will try to introduce a methodology to, to try to provide an answer to the question. But in fact, the question, uh, which is very central in uh, contemporary academic debates and, and public debates and, uh, and just uh, conversations between people, is that uh, um, um, there are different opinions. And what has um, been quite at the center of the scene uh, recently has been uh, the debate uh, on one hand uh, between the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Alliance, the IHRA, um, which in 2016, uh, after uh, years of, of, of uh, deliberations and, and thought uh, published, uh, uh, a definition of anti-Semitism, and, uh, and uh, the more recent uh, Van Leer group, also known as the Jerusalem group, uh, the, the Jerusalem definition uh, of anti-Semitism, uh, which uh, uh, basically um, uh, disagrees with the IHRA, uh, although there are many commonalities, as we shall also see uh, shortly. But uh, what uh, I uh, would uh, observe is uh, the following. In, in these debates, the uh, empirical social sciences have been left out. That is, the, this, these, these are uh, <clears throat> groups of well-intentioned and, uh, and, and highly knowledgeable experts who um, make sort of uh, ivory tower decisions about the nature of anti-Semitism without considering uh, enough, in my view, if at all, the perceptions of real world Jews. Those people who are uh, in the street, they are directly and personally affected and, uh, and often offended by uh, anti-Semitism. So the question is to, um, is it possible to bridge between the, the academic perception of anti-Semitism and, and the practical perception as it uh, really happens? And um, uh, in fact, um, there are some commonalities between these major efforts. And in a moment, I will um, address some of them. Um, and nearly all of them have suggested a battery of examples, uh, which are supposed to better characterize the main contents uh, of uh, what uh, antisemitism supposedly is. And so there are several uh, options, this and this and this, and I, I, I will return to this in a moment. And each detailed list of items, though can be collapsed into a more succinct uh, classification of three or four major typological groups. And I think this is um, agreed and quite important. And um, uh, so perusing the IHRA definition, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, definition that preceded it by a couple of years uh, in terms of a very big uh, world survey of anti-Semitism that they did uh, in uh, more than 100 countries. The uh, FRA survey, that is the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union surveys, uh, to which uh, I was associated in 2012 and in 2018, uh, which, uh, as we shall see in depth, uh, uh, covered several uh, countries in the European Union. And, uh, and finally, the, the Jerusalem definition, the Van Leer group, uh, they all identify several quite overlapping major uh, domains uh, of contents. And so to share with you, I will now uh, move to, um, to a, a PowerPoint that, uh, that I have uh, uh, prepared and uh, I will uh, go to, um, <coughs> Uh, to this, um, I will um, uh, expand the screen and, um, uh, sorry, I will expand uh, the screen and I hope it is now uh, visible. In fact, uh, this is the title, How Best to Define Anti-Semitism, a Structural Approach. And um, um, initially what uh, I do is to compare 
five different efforts um, that have been uh, performed in recent years. I have already mentioned them. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League survey of 100 countries uh, where the target population uh, were uh, general uh, inhabitants of those uh, countries, uh, no, not Jews. It's, it's a survey, uh, the ADL 2014, it's a survey of general populations with samples in, uh, in each country. And they submitted a questionnaire uh, proposing a certain number of items that uh, uh, supposedly represented uh, forms of anti-Jewish uh, prejudice. And, um, and then uh, um, they uh, collected the answers and, and created uh, several indexes of how much uh, that population can be rated um, affected by anti-Semitic prejudice. The IHRA, uh, as known, is of course uh, an exercise which tries to, to review history and, uh, and, uh, and the situation at large, and then tries to extract uh, certain fundamental themes. Uh, the Fundamental Rights uh, Agency, are, these are two surveys in 2012 and 2018, where the target population were the Jews, um, not as in the case of the ADL. Uh, uh, big Jewish samples were um, uh, selected uh, in uh, many countries in Europe. And so these are the perceptions of Jews in the case of the uh, FRA. And, and again, the questionnaires included uh, several options about items and experiences of um, anti-Semitism and or discrimination in their life. And finally, the GDA, which is, is again an, an intellectual exercise based on experience, on reading and on conversation. Now, when, when we look at, um, at the questionnaires without entering into the detail of, of really reading all of the questions, we find that uh, there are certain th common themes. One of them is um, the uh, uh, attribute of the, uh, 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 striving to destroy um, and or assault the Jews. This is, of course, a negative example. It is mentioned by the IHRA and by the JDA. Uh, but uh, there is a greater focus on, on Jewish power. This is one of the classic uh, ideas, uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion and, 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 and many, others, uh, many other manifestations uh, of <clears throat> anti-Semitism, uh, which appear, in fact, they are quite dominant in the ADL survey. Six out of 11 questions concerned that point. Uh, two points in the IHRA, two uh, respectively in each of the two FRA and, and also the GDA, GDA gives them uh, two uh, items uh, out of 10. Uh, the other uh, aspects, uh, which is also historically typical, at least uh, considering the 19th and the 20th century, uh, the Jews uh, as a foreigner, the Jews as an other, the Jews which uh, does not belong. So Jewish foreigners diversity, this is mentioned, uh, as you see, with different uh, proportions in the different uh, sources. <coughs> then we move to items that we can call uh, Holocaust related, uh, denial and minimization, exploitation of Holocaust. And, um, and then we move to Israel related items, uh, which is uh, again, denial of the right of Israel uh, to exist uh, or demonization uh, of Israel or other forms which are uh, utterly negative of the uh, Israeli uh, existence. And these again appear in, in all of the five sources I mentioned here. There is one more interesting item that we put in the FRA 2012. Uh, Jews are a religion and not a nation. The underlying idea was that uh, since they are not a nation, then they are not um, entitled to have a national state, which is Israel. So in a sense, it is a subcategory uh, of, uh, of the Israel-related negative attitude. So if you look at this, we have uh, all in all about 54 different questions. And of, uh, among them, about one third or slightly more uh, pertain to the upper part, which is the anti-Jewish related <coughs> content. <coughs> there is a smaller but, uh, but clearly <coughs> shared point about uh, uh, Holocaust, and then again, quite quite a large attention uh, to Jewish questions, uh, particularly the IHRA uh, and, and the JDA uh, definitions uh, devote a substantial space, half or more than half, <coughs> uh, to the Israeli team, saying what is 
anti-Semitic when <clears throat> Israel uh, is uh, mentioned. But there is an interesting feature. Uh, the Van Leer uh, Jerusalem definition uh, stands out because it also, in addition to defining what anti-Semitism is, it also defines what anti-Semitism is not. And so they give another uh, five um, uh, elements, five items, explaining uh, quite at large, at length, uh, what uh, the contents uh, might be, and saying this type of expression is not anti-Semitic. This is part of legitimate discourse. This is part of freedom of speech. This is part of uh, political opinion. And um, um, so um, they do something which is quite interesting, uh, because in fact, the same approach might be applied also to the other uh, types of uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, attitude. In fact, uh, we might think that there are also expressions related to the Holocaust, which uh, uh, while we do not agree with them, uh, they are not anti-Semitic. I'll, I'll give you the example. If someone says um, during the Holocaust, uh, 15,000 Jews perished, and most of them because uh, of typhus. This is an anti-Semitic statement. But if someone says 4.7 million Jews perished in the Holocaust, I think this is incompetent. And I think uh, the reality is much higher. But you cannot say that this is a priori anti-Semitic. And the same um, in relation to certain attributes of the Jews. If you say that, for example, this is quite uh, uh, obvious, uh, many Jews won the Nobel Prize uh, this is true. You can uh, perhaps give the, the wrong number of uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners who were Jewish, but, uh, but uh, this is certainly not anti-Semitic. But if you say that all of the Jews are intelligent and therefore they have primacy everywhere in the sciences and uh, in knowledge, uh, this, uh, of course, is quite different. So what I'm saying is that quite surprisingly, uh, there has not been the same sensitivity to uh, distinguishing what other type of statement, uh, which uh, again is probably mistaken uh, or, or even um, um, somewhat uh, um, aggressive, uh, yet is not uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, the GDA only focused on, on Israel. And, and this is, in my view, um, a weakness because it shows that uh, there is an excessive focus on, on one aspect. Uh, all of these aspects are important and in a moment we will see also the relations that exist between them, but you cannot uh, only focus on, on one. So it becomes, in, uh, in my perception, a little bit too much uh, uh, turning into a political argument, maybe um, just an advocacy argument, uh, but not something that uh, gives a, an absolutely balanced judgment about the issue of defining anti-Semitism. And so um, I think this is due mostly to the fact that this is academic discourse and it is somewhat unrelated to the perception by the people. The main point in my uh, uh, chat is that uh, we would like to return to the people the decision about how to better define anti-Semitism. In other words, anti-Semitism, in my view, should be defined based on what the actual perceptions of the victims are. The victims are those who identify themselves and sometimes are identified by others as Jews. As a, a basis for a valid definition, we need to demonstrate empirically what those perceptions of the anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish or Judeophobic attitudes are. And also we need to assess what Jews think um, a better or, or the right attitude towards them uh, expectedly uh, should be. By the way, let me say that I uh, clearly uh, am speaking all the time about anti-Semitism, but I'm, I'm not happy. I, I'm absolutely not happy about, about uh, the term. I think the term is offensive and I certainly agree with those. I think uh, Gunther is among them who have advocated to use perhaps Judeophobia <coughs> as a better term. But since this is the common term, I will uh, use it uh, all through uh, my, my chat. So let's go to the, to the FRA 2018 survey. <coughs> In this paper, sorry, I will present a structural analysis of the 2018 uh, Fundamental Rights Agency survey in 12 European Union countries. 
the study was conducted uh, through the internet, covered over 16,000 self-assessed Jews in 12 uh, European Union countries, <coughs> including all the largest Jewish community. I will review the main findings regarding the channels of transmission of antisemitism, the main contents of uh, antisemitic expressions, uh, the identity of perpetrators, all of this as perceived uh, by uh, those 16,000 Jews. And I will try to suggest a new and better analytic typology, or at least terminology <coughs> of the main patterns of diffusion and perception of antisemitism. So let, let's go to <coughs> just the minimum information about the sample. In, in 2018, we had uh, more than 16,000 cases. They were distributed in 12, uh, across 12 countries. Uh, one of them was the United Kingdom, which was uh, still a member at the time. Um, in 2012, we had about um, 5,600 5, 5, cases in fewer countries. Now, if we compare the, the same countries that were covered twice, uh, that is Belgium, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Sweden, and the UK, we find that between 2012 and 2018, the number of cases uh, nearly, uh, in fact, more than doubled. And uh, this uh, means that probably the um, methodology was better, the penetration of the sample was more efficient, but also the interest of the public in the team at stake had grown considerably. Uh, 16,000 is it's quite a big sample. It represents about 1.6% of the total uh, Jewish population. And uh, indeed the rate of response was not exactly the same in every country, somewhere more, somewhere less, but uh, it is uh, quite uh, a significant uh, achievement uh, to have put together this study. I, I will not um, uh, spend much uh, time uh, describing the representativeness of the sample. The sample has been checked vis-a-vis uh, -vis other sources in terms of age, sex, geography, and uh, it has resulted quite uh, faithful vis-a-vis uh, -vis other sources, other reliable sources that we have. So we can say, um, uh, as usual, the internet is a source which has to be taken with caution, uh, but uh, we have evidence that uh, the uh, participation reflects uh, very much, in any case, all of the different age groups and, uh, and genders and socioeconomic uh, uh, strata, and, uh, and fundamentally also the affiliated and the non-affiliated parts of the Jewish population, which uh, in fact allows uh, interesting comparisons and uh, gives us a sense that uh, we have not missed fundamentally any uh, important component uh, of the Jewish uh, population. I just want to mention that uh, the main report about uh, the survey was published in uh, 2018 uh, by the uh, European Union Agency itself. Uh, the um, uh, report can be downloaded uh, from the internet. Uh, I think the organizers of this particular uh, webinar uh, have it. Uh, in any case, I'll be happy to share uh, the quotation. And uh, it is a very interesting reading. In addition, I, my, my chat is based fundamentally on two long papers I have published, uh, one in 2020 and one in 2022. Um, the, um, the earlier publication, in fact, relates to uh, my analysis of the 2018 survey. The later publication, for some reason, relates to my study of the earlier publication and uh, they are also easily uh, available. I will be happy to provide copies to those interested. Now, um, a, a technical explanation which is due in my study, as you know, I, I do a quantitative work. I use a technique which is not uh, super known and is called similarity structure analysis, initially developed by, by the late Louis, Louis Gutmann was an American uh, scientist uh, who uh, lived uh, uh, many years uh, in Israel at the Hebrew University. SSA is a methodology aimed at exploring the interrelations that exist among large numbers of variables, rather than focusing on explaining uh, only one or a few at a time. Uh, we do not focus on frequencies, although of course frequencies are important. We try to uh, represent the web of mutual correlations 
that exist among the entire set of variables included in a given analysis. Uh, SSA transforms, the software transforms the extent of statistical covariation of those variables, namely their mutual proximity or diversity, into physical distances, which are representable on maps. Um, the emerging visual configurations are helpful to assessing the overall contents of a given subject matter and its logical partitions into meaningful domains. In other words, as you will see, uh, I present maps and not statistical tables most uh, of the time, and this is much easier to follow. Numbers sometimes are, are a bit uh, hostile. And so the, the goal is this, from many individual representations, we are able to construct the logic of the system. Just listen to this. We have 16,000 cases. And in this survey, we have 54 questions. So if you multiply the, the 16,000 people by the 54 answers they gave, we have 850,000 answers. That would be a little bit boring to represent statistically. But if we do that graphically, as we shall see, I think uh, the matter will become clearer in a moment. But let's uh, show you how, how it works. So first, the conventional statistical table. This is taken from the 2018 FRA. Uh, we have a question which is subdivided into items, each of which elicits an answer. So here we have uh, seven uh, possible uh, options regarding the question of assessing social and political issues as a problem in your country. Uh, in uh, the 12 uh, European Union member states that were covered. And so we have anti-Semitism, racism, crime level, etc. You see it on, on screen. And we have the percentages. Um, first of all, let's go to uh, the 12 country average. We find, interestingly, perhaps not surprisingly, since this is a Jewish sample, that at the top of the uh, concern, we have anti-Semitism and racism, uh, nearly with the same uh, percentage uh, of, of respondents, uh, followed by crime level, unemployment, uh, immigration, intolerance toward Muslims, which is an interesting question because it shows the concern of Jews toward Muslims, not Muslims as a danger, but Muslims as to some extent associates in the suffering of the minorities. And finally, uh, government uh, corruption. As you can see uh, in different countries, the answers were somewhat different, although there were many commonalities. Uh, we have the blue self where uh, you have the three highest in each country, but uh, those rounded with the red circle are those with uh, the highest percentage of response in each country. And, and you can see in most cases, anti-Semitism uh, and or racism are the top concern. Uh, but in Italy, for example, it was unemployment. In uh, Spain and Hungary, it was uh, government corruption. In uh, Denmark, it was uh, intolerance toward Muslims. So this is the classic cross tabulation. It gives a lot of information, but still, uh, I think we can improve. And the improvement comes this way. This is exactly the same that you have seen uh, just a moment ago. But uh, it is done by calculating the correlations between the different variables, taking into account the country differences, and, and seeing how much a variable is uh, similar or distant from another based on the answers that we elicited from those 16,000. And here, as you can see, we have uh, some value added. First of all, we have something in the center uh, indeed, as you remember, the two uh, items, racism and anti-Semitism, had the highest percentages. But uh, um, in this uh, uh, methodology, not always the highest percentage uh, turns uh, to be the central part of the configuration. Uh, in fact, the central part is the one uh, which is accepted by all in terms uh, of whatever else they did. And uh, those other uh, items that appear here uh, at the different uh, peripheral corners uh, of uh, this map are sort of specialized answers. So there are people and uh, maybe countries where the Muslim issue is most important, but uh, another issue is not important. And um, you find in fact that unemployment and crime level are highly correlated. Uh, immigration uh, is not uh, at all correlated with government uh, corruption, but racism is correlated with everything else. 
and, and anti-Semitism. Uh, and so it uh, turns to be the central concern of this particular public. There is one uh, further interesting element that emerges from this particular analysis. And that is that in the mind of Jews, um, perhaps surprisingly, immigration and Muslims are not related. These are two different concerns. Some, someone might have thought that there is a lot of concern for immigration and, and Muslims, but this is not the case. Jews can understand that uh, immigration is an issue and, and, and uh, attitudes to Muslims uh, is another issue and they are not necessarily uh, overlapping. This is an interesting uh, point that we discover. But let's move forward and let's go now to the core of the anti-Semitism question. So the um, anti-Semitism perceptions, um, I used to say are um, in fact of three types as many other perceptions. Uh, there is the uh, uh, cognitive intellectual aspect that is you think that a certain expression, a certain thing is anti-Semitic. So this is uh, theory, this is your understanding, this is your analysis, but this is different from your experience. You have had direct contact with that thing. It is uh, therefore behavioral, experiential. And, uh, and these are two different domains. They are related, but uh, they have also to be understood separately. Finally, uh, now, now I will say that most research about anti-Semitism currently uh, analyzes these two components, these two domains, the cognitive and the behavioral. There is a third um, a dimension, uh, which I call the affective emotional, which is nearly uh, never studied, that is, what uh, does anti-Semitism to you personally, in terms uh, of your emotions, in terms of your affective sphere? For example, does anti-Semitism uh, makes you more alone or more part of a community? It makes you more defensive or more aggressive? And there are several other questions that, that we may ask. I think this is a fundamental component of the study because there is no question that anti-Semitism caused a certain emotional reaction among the victims, but we have very little evidence about this. And this is a first uh, suggestion for future research to devote some time and attention also to this. So we are in fact, uh, uh, even in the FRA 2018, confined to behavioral and experiential. And so back for a moment to the percentages. We have on the upper part, the cognitive, that is, there are certain opinions that our 16,000 respondents consider to be anti-Semitic. And then on the bottom part, there are certain experiences, that is, our 16,000 heard a statement made by a non-Jewish person. And so let's uh, first of all, look at uh, the uh, frequencies. And uh, uh, there is one notion that uh, we uh, catch at uh, first sight, the upper part has much higher percentages than the bottom part. And I think this is uh, uh, already an important lesson. If we don't make this distinction, sometimes we quote percentages of the incidence of the anti-Semitic phenomenology, which are based either on the cognitive or on the experiential, but in fact, these are two different things. They, they pertain to two different perceptions in the uh, human brain. And uh, the tendency is that the percentages in the cognitive are much higher than the percentages in the experiential. For example, uh, of all of the data that uh, we have here, that the one that disturbs the most is uh, in fact a denial of the Holocaust. 95% of the Jews think uh, this is anti-Semitic. 92% uh, think it is anti-Semitic to believe that Jews exploit Holocaust victimhood for their own purposes, economic, political, and so on. The other hand, and these are Holocaust related um, uh, 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 opinions. Of course, if we go to the question, did you actually hear that? You find that between 25 and 35% and not more than 90% actually heard that opinion. In terms of the Jewish related, uh, does not consider Jews uh, living in, in the particular country uh, to be country nationals, 94%. Uh, Jews have too much power, 92%. They bring anti-Semitism on themselves, uh, nearly 90%. They cannot integrate in the country. They are different from the rest of the population. Uh, they have recognizable features. That is, they are physically different. 
75% think it's anti-Semitic, would not marry a Jew. 59% always notes who is Jewish among his or her acquaintances, uh, just more, more, more than half. And again, the uh, actual experiences are much lower. Uh, more or less, they are uh, ranked in the same order, uh, but the distinction between the, between the cognitive and, and the experiential is, is fundamental uh, uh, so far as, as far as the percentages are concerned. And finally, the Israel-related, um, the world would be a better place without Israel, 88% uh, rank that as anti-Semitic. Israelis behave like Nazis, 85%, supports boycott of Israel or Israelis, 82%, and uh, criticizes Israel, 33%. Uh, uh, by the way, this is a very important point. The difference between these two items, uh, in my view, is fundamentally important because uh, on the one hand, we have a Jewish population in Europe saying basically that BDS is anti-Semitic. However, they also say the majority, the majority of two thirds say it is perfectly legitimate to criticize Israel, although there is also a hardcore component in the community that does not uh, tolerate, even if I say, uh, you know, yesterday the train uh, arrived uh, too late. Uh, that's a criticism. And yet uh, there will be people who will not tolerate even that kind of, of criticism. But I think it's important uh, to uh, note uh, the, uh, the frequencies of the first three items, and also again, to find how in the experiential, um, Israelis behave like Nazis uh, is considered anti-Semitic. And it is in fact, the only item among those which we have in the bottom part of the table, uh, which uh, gains a majority uh, of the respondents, uh, all of the other, items had significantly lower uh, percentages. Now, what happens when I apply the SSA methodology to a table like this? And this is what we get. And I think this is quite interesting. In the first place, we find that uh, indeed, mentally, uh, the correlations between the different questions, remember those questions we have seen in the format of a table, were discrete, that is each appeared on their own separately. But now we present the correlations between each question and each other question in the mind of each of the 16,000 respondents. And, and this is of course the software which does that operation. And uh, we find that uh, we um, indeed uh, neatly can partition the mental space into the three items, Jewish related, um, Holocaust related, Israel related. Um, and uh, we have a, a neat separation between uh, the uh, cognitive and the experiential, uh, but uh, they all uh, uh, neatly pertain to the domain of contents that relates uh, to a certain item. And so there is a, an in inherent logic uh, in the partition between uh, these three uh, main domains um, and uh, uh, the fact that some are experiential and some are uh, cognitive is uh, at the end of the day, not so much important uh, if uh, in fact we uh, ask uh, the same question that uh, is appearing here in the bottom part regarding uh, to the upper part, the correlation is uh, quite obviously extremely uh, strong. So I think we have now made a point, we start uh, entering the mind of the uh, European Jews and, and, and by implication of other Jews. And we find that they quite clearly perceive the anti-Semitic space organized very clearly uh, between uh, the three main uh, uh, sectors of uh, Jewish related, Holocaust related, Israel related. And uh, now uh, we uh, continue. And uh, um, here I continue by presenting a somewhat uh, simplified um, graphical presentation. Um, the original graphs are a bit uh, clumsy. The questions are many. So in, uh, in this and in the following graphs, I will limit myself to uh, selected uh, answers and uh, to um, a more friendly um, uh, sort of uh, graphical presentation. So let's first uh, ask uh, about the channels of antisemitism diffusion. Uh, we know, in fact, that anti-Semitism can be 
um, propagated and, and diffused uh, in different uh, ways, uh, fundamentally through the social uh, media, uh, in the street, uh, at the sports stadium, uh, or by um, uh, profanating cemeteries, through graffiti, uh, through uh, public leaders and, and, and assemblies, uh, it can uh, happen. Uh, and again, these are the questions we ask uh, through the educated media, uh, the TV, the, the, uh, the dailies, uh, through cultural activities, uh, through academy. And, uh, and the BDS is of course, one of the, of the channels. The interesting thing is that uh, the, 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 the spots, the particular spots where uh, these uh, different uh, items uh, are plotted in this chart uh, reflect exactly what the SSA uh, technology does. That is, they put them closer or uh, more distant uh, according to the correlation that exists uh, between them. In other words, between the educated media and the stadium, uh, there is a big distance. It means that um, uh, the respondents perceive that it is not exactly the same people uh, who do those things, although both may do uh, something that is inherently anti-Semitic. And uh, interestingly also, uh, public assemblies and, uh, and political leaders, they are very distant from academy and culture. They are perceived as, as, as totally different uh, in uh, their uh, active um, uh, dissemination of anti-Semitism. Uh, what is interesting is that more or less at the center of this configuration, we have the web. That is the internet is uh, identified as an instrument of propagation of negative messages. Although we saw, uh, and, and we know very well that the internet can also be a very uh, positive element in the diffusion of culture and uh, of uh, uh, significantly uh, intelligent uh, and educated message. Now we add another layer. We speak uh, uh, not only of the channels, but also of the major contents. And so we see that a certain uh, amount of proximity and distance appears. There is this message of otherness. The Jew uh, does not belong. And this message of Holocaust denial, uh, they appear in an area of the map, which is cl rather close to the stadium and to the street and to the socials. Uh, whereas um, the contents, which is related to Israel, appears quite uh, strictly related to academy, uh, to cultural activities, to the more educated part uh, of the um, um, anti-Semitic uh, message, as is perceived by our sample of 16,000 European Jews. Uh, physical violence is something that uh, correlates very well with profanation of cemeteries and, and other items which I've not plotted. Again, this is a very selective representation of the answers. There are many more and they logically fit the different uh, uh, parts uh, of this, uh, of this uh, 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 graph. So we have seen the correlation between the channels and the main contents. Let's look uh, now at uh, a third layer and that's the uh, perpetrators. The question was who you perceive are the perpetrators uh, of anti-Semitism. And so we have the separate percentages of each of them. But then the interest here is to see what correlation exists between a given type of perpetrator as perceived by, by the respondents, a given type of contents, and a given type of uh, channel of transmission. And so here we see that denial of the Holocaust, uh, denial of the Jew as uh, a member of society are more particularly the domain of the right-wing expressions and to some extent of the Christian expressions. Uh, although I must say that uh, in the FRA uh, 2018 survey, the right was much more dominant than, than the Christian. The Christian was of course dominant in the past, but not, not very much in this particular survey. On the other hand, uh, left uh, opinions are more correlated to negative opinions regarding Israel, and they are also more often associated with uh, people who operate in the academy uh, and in the higher level of the cultural world. Physical violence is more often associated with Islamic perpetrators, and uh, uh, as you see, uh, each uh, uh, domain 
and the, the different layers of contents that I represent here as a very definite configuration and the correlations that uh, we express here graphically uh, begin uh, to provide a, quite a clear pattern of how the people uh, in Europe, how Jews in Europe perceive uh, the whole phenomenology. And um, uh, the next step is to find a sort of definition in uh, terms of what we have found so far. And so I think that uh, it is appropriate to call the populist uh, sector all of uh, that uh, happens in the street uh, in uh, big uh, meetings of people not necessarily highly educated in spontaneous expressions uh, through uh, the media, uh, more particularly concerning Holocaust denial, otherness of the Jew and the right wing and, and Christian messages. Uh, political leaders and assemblies interestingly occupy uh, an area in the perception which is uh, of its own, somewhat more related to, to the right than to the left. Uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, practical type of anti-Semitic expression, um, meaning uh, physical aspects and, and manifestations that are uh, actually uh, violent and, and can be uh, configured as uh, involving uh, contact uh, or aggression. And, and finally, the narrative, which characterizes the uh, more uh, educated, as uh, uh, I can uh, stress here, uh, the media, um, the uh, cultural, the academic, the anti-Israelis, and, and the more left-oriented part uh, of uh, discourse. So that finally, it can boil down to, to these four terms, the populist, the, pop, the political, the practical, and the narrative. I think these are terms that uh, I would uh, like to, uh, willingly to see introduced in a discourse about anti-Semitism because they sort of uh, parsimoniously um, convey quite a lot of information and they are quite consistently related to a lot of uh, data that uh, uh, I have presented very uh, succinctly uh, here. Again, I stress that at the center of all is the web because the web in fact operates in, in all of these different functions. It is uh, operating politically uh, in a populist way, in a narrative and, and more uh, intelligent way. <laughs> I will not deny that at the very moment we are meeting uh, today, this very moment we are using the web uh, to do something which uh, in a sense uh, uh, helps uh, us uh, uh, perhaps uh, usefully uh, to make uh, some order uh, in discourse and, and also in, in the practical sense. So uh, I think this is a terminology that we can use also in the future. But now there is a further element that we need to clarify and that's the place of anti-Semitism in Jewish identity. Uh, so far I've focused on the negatives and I've tried to provide a, a, a quick typology uh, of the components of the negative, but the positive is that Jews think of themselves also in terms of certain essential contents that are part of their uh, mind, their soul, their uh, uh, affective world. And uh, um, it uh, is also represented to, uh, through a series of um, indicators, uh, in other words, questions in a questionnaire that we can uh, rank uh, by frequency, but we can also represent graphically with the SSA method looking at the correlations and the coherence uh, and consistency of the system. Now uh, here um, I present uh, uh, two results, the 2012 and the 2018, and I think it's quite interesting to make this comparison. So first of all, let us uh, give a look, a quick look at the 2012. We understand the Jewish identity has different components and options. Uh, one is uh, sort of the normative ritual, believe in God uh, and uh, observing the Shabbat, eating kosher, study text. Uh, th this is the normative ritual part of, uh, uh, of Jewish identity, which uh, is quite close on the one hand to festivals and the family and uh, family reunions. On the one hand, uh, charity and, and community and voluntarism. And then we move in a sort of circular pattern um, from charity to that uh, very important component uh, that is the moral ethical component of Jewish identity, uh, which is more universal, the cultural component. And here we, we are talking of, of general culture with uh, a Jewish contents and not necessarily the traditional culture. And then moving to 
Holocaust and anti-Semitism, which once again, we find uh, highly correlated. And then uh, moving to uh, support for Israel, which is for many a uh, component of their Jewish identity. And finally, to a sense of Jewish peoplehood. Uh, are you uh, proud? Are you a member? Are you, do you value uh, Jewish peoplehood as an important component, which turns back from peoplehood uh, to, to the family? Now, this um, uh, is, uh, um, in fact, uh, true in Europe. It is true nearly in every other country uh, of the world. I mean, this uh, circular pattern and the particular segmentation of Jewish uh, identity. But what I find of, uh, of special interest here is the proximity between uh, Israel and peoplehood. This is perhaps not surprising, but also the proximity between Israel and Holocaust. That is, uh, um, I'm, I'm saying that once you touch upon one of them, to some extent, you create a parallel reaction, uh, I insist, emotional, affective in, in the other one and, and vice versa. There is a proximity here uh, which uh, causes us to thought, to think uh, what uh, can be the consequences when we return uh, to the syndrome of anti-Semitism. In 2018, the questionnaire was uh, slightly shorter, but very similar. And so we find uh, fundamentally uh, that the pattern is the same. We find the normative ritual uh, as it was, the festival where they were and charity where it was, unfortunately, the question about moral ethics was not asked, but then we find anti-Semitism and Holocaust uh, more or less where they were. And, uh, and here we have culture. Uh, culture uh, has somewhat moved uh, in the previous uh, version. It was here, um, bottom uh, uh, left, and here it is upper left. But what has happened extraordinarily is something else. And it is that these two variables, Israel support, and Jewish peoplehood have moved much more to the center of the perception. That is, uh, perhaps uh, I would argue under the pressure of uh, what is perceived often as a hostile environment, many Jews have um, turned to a stronger perception of Israel as important in their Jewish identity and of Jewish peoplehood as a resort, as a home, as something which is needed to give sense and coherence to the rest. And so by uh, turning here to the center of the configuration, it means they strongly correlate with everything else. And they represent a sort of, if not a compromise, if not the origin, at least something that is more central in the perception of European Jews. And this is a phenomenon that evidently has strengthened in the course of the years between 2012 and 2018. And so I come to several conclusions. My first observation, uh, which is quite obvious, is that in, uh, in rough uh, generalization, anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, uh, Judeophobia, again, I stress, I I'm not a fan of anti-Semitism. I prefer uh, other terms, but uh, that's the standard. It may be perceived as an outlook aimed at achieving one or more of three main goals. One is physical violence and annihilation of the Jew. Now, honestly, today it's, it's not very significant. This is something that has been tragically true in the past, not, not really uh, makes many headlines today, although, although there are cases and we have every year a certain number of physical victims of anti-Semitism, not uh, as serious as it might have been. Two, marginalization and exclusion of the Jew from civil, social, economic, and cultural life. Uh, this is uh, also partly true, but not so much. Uh, after all, uh, the vast majority of Jews today live in democratic societies. Their civil rights are preserved. They have equality and uh, benefit of the law. So it is uh, true that uh, there may be an attempt to do that, but this is not really what, what happens for the most. And then the worsening of the Jews' private quality of life by arousing fear, frustration, and anxiety. This, I think this is the real thing that happens today. I mentioned before the need to deepen the study of the affective emotional aspects of uh, the perception of anti-Semitism, but I think this is really what makes people angry or fearful and uh, maybe proactive or, or less active 
and uh, and this is uh, certainly what anti-Semitism actually does to people. It makes them unhappy. It makes them nervous. Now, as I have uh, argued, uh, clearly uh, contemporary anti-Semitism uh, has three major axes of negationism. We, we saw some of this initially when we uh, had a compilation of different uh, um, uh, definitions of anti-Semitism, and then empirically we find that in fact there are three perceived negationism axes where the Jews is denied a as an individual the right to enjoy civil, social, cultural, and political equality um, to uh, like uh, li likewise any other uh, individual uh, in society. Uh, I say this is not really happening too much, but it does happen to some extent and in certain countries. Second, as a potential victim and a survivor of planned extermination, the right to preserve and transmit his her own authentic memory of the destruction uh, of one's own people, the Shoah. You know, there is such a polemics about memory and about the day of remembrance. <coughs> and this has become really, really an important theme uh, in the debate. <coughs> and three, <coughs> as a member of a national collective, the right to exert corporate national sovereignty through an independent state, Israel, which of course has to be a democratic state and the liberal state and not uh, and nothing else but the right to have that state is sometimes uh, debated and not uh, legitimized so uh, there are these four strategies um, uh, of anti-semitism as perceived by the target population in which as i noted the contents and the medium uh, have in fact uh, overlapped to a point that they are hardly distinguished. We, we, we speak of the internet often uh, and of the media often as the actual vector of anti-Semitism, but in reality we have these uh, four major and different strategies. The practical strategy, physical uh, action and aggression in the street or other public places, vandalism of Jewish buildings and institutions, uh, the secretion of Jewish cemeteries. <coughs> the political um, uh, option manifested in public life, reflecting political interests, leadership struggles, uh, political events and political speeches and discussions. Note that the political component has its own roots in, in, in politics. That is, politics is a very uh, complex uh, compl uh, um, uh, series of uh, events, interactions, uh, decisions and acts. And uh, uh, of course, uh, anti-Semitism is only one component, therefore, it appears as something uh, independent from uh, other uh, manifestations. It does not uh, really um, uh, coincide with the others. The populist form, which is manifested through spontaneous and defamatory expressions uh, on the internet, including the social media, graffiti, social situations, the public space, sports events. And finally, the narrative, anti-Semitism, thoughtful and research items in the printed electronic press, in academia and at cultural uh, events. These are the perceptions of the Jews uh, in Europe. Uh, we would suggest that uh, the mode of proceeding toward a robust definition of anti-Semitism should be iterative, beginning with the formulation of certain hypotheses regarding the main patterns of anti-Semitism and continuing with the empirical verification of their presence, frequency, consistence and applicability, which I've tried to do uh, this time uh, looking at European data. But of course, we can repeat that with American data and other data. Only as a final outcome, why may start suggesting the elaboration of a synthetic definition that must consider, though, the perceptions of the people at stake, which has not been done so much in the past. Beyond the usual descriptive analysis, much greater attention should be devoted to antisemitism, cognitive, experiential, and especially effective modes of perception, the practical populist, political, and narrative modes of expression, and, and, and make that explicit, the direct or virtual channels of manifestation and diffusion, the characteristics of perpetrators, and emerging interrelations between all of these different aspects. Incidentally, there is a regional variation across the European Union that should be uh, stressed. I, I did not have the time uh, this time to, to, to do that, maybe in the debate later, there are very interesting regional 
patterns. In particular, in view of the strong perceptional interconnection that emerges among the vast majority of contemporary Jews between Holocaust-related and Israel-related themes, the attempt to excorporate Israel from the standard definitions of anti-Semitism appears to be analytically ill-advised and out of touch with widespread feelings among the Jewish population. This does not mean in any way that Israel cannot be the object of legitimate criticism, obviously, as evidently shown by our data on Jewish perceptions, not to mention the lively political debate that prevails within the country itself. And so in the context of uh, our continuing debate about the definitions of anti-Semitism, our findings um, carry important implications for in-depth understanding of the issues for developing new relevant and verifiable insights. Uh, also maybe uh, adding a few words to the usual terminology and for developing more appropriate and effective public and private initiatives to fighting anti-Semitism. And here I'm thanking you for your patience and I conclude my chat. Thank you very much.